I was like, come at me. I was like, you can make bread in a microwave Amazing. and fudge. Really? And brownies, mac and cheese, chilli, risotto, kedgeroo, mug cakes. You can roast a chicken in a microwave. Hi, I'm Lucy Dunn and I'm here with Jack Munro, who is a food writer and food poverty campaigner. And she's just published her third cookbook mm -hmm. called Cooking on a Bootstrap. Yeah. Um, congratulations. Thank you. So do you have certain rules when you're writing a recipe? Um, yeah, I try to strip it right back to the basics. I, I look at it all and just think, is that necessary? Is that essential? What does that add to the recipe? I take out as much as possible. I suppose it's a bit like the old Coco Chanel saying when she says, before you leave the house, take at least two things off. Yeah. And that's before I publish a recipe, take at least two things out. And I mean, we are as far apart in worlds as, as it is possible to be, but the basic rule is the same. Is, is this essential? Does it add value? And um, is it really necessary? And yeah. a lot of the time the answer is no. Yeah, there's a quite a lot of sort of snobbery around food in general, isn't there? In yeah, definitely. There's quite a lot of... Uh, I think I'm like the, the antichrist of the food world in a way that people, some food writers, are trying their hardest to shoehorn the best of the best into their recipes and telling you why you need this type of salt and why you need to go to this market and why you need this expensive exotic ingredient. And I'm like, tin of spuds, tin of sardines, yeah. there you go. Yeah, really down to earth. Do you ever come to sort of a, any blows with sort of food purists at all over things like tin veg and stuff? Quite frequently. Um, the late, great Shirley Good wrote... Um, an article about me once where she said um, that all I do is cook with tinned food and fish paste and surely anyone can do that and my response to her was well actually we're at a point obviously Shirley was of a few generations before me we're at a point where people don't know how to do that anymore there, there is a generational gap where the idea of opening your cupboard and making something with what you've got has completely bypassed um, my generation mm. at, as at large um, and so although what I do may seem simple to uh, to some people, actually, it can be really bloody difficult. Mm, mm. I, I think when you look at your recipes, you can look, I, when I look at them, um, I look at them and go, I can do all of that. I've got mm. everything, all of that in my cupboard right now. Mm. And I don't need to start worrying about whether it's mould and sea salt. Or yep. Yeah, and, and that's the whole idea was that people say, oh, well, why don't, you, why don't you talk about going to the market or why don't you shop at, like, Aldi or Lidl? And like, because I wanted to make sure that my recipes are available to people who live in what we call food deserts, people who've only got a convenience store around the corner yeah. from them or people who, you know, get their shopping delivered from a, an online supermarket delivery. It's, I wanted to make sure that everyone, as far as possible, could do my recipes and that... Of course, there's always ways to do things cheaper. If you can go at 10 p.m. when the yellow stickers get stuck on things, or if you've got a great local fruit and veg market, brilliant. Use those resources at your disposal. But by limiting my recipes to those resources, I'd alienate a large group of people who cookbooks are generally not written for. Mm, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'd describe your cooking as sort of as down to earth and as mm. non poncy as you can get. Um, I mean, I think there's some, some br brilliant recipes in there, like the unfuckable pizza dough. Yeah. Um, and the fact that you say just use, you don't have to use wholemeal flour, mm -hmm. you can use white. Yep. Yeah. And the whole thing in your book is about just not worrying about doing the expensive ingredients mm -hmm. and going down to the down-to-earth, sort of cheaper, cheaper things. Have you got any other tips you can...? Well, it's pretty much that. I think one of the things that, that I try to emphasise in all my books is that if you haven't got something, there's usually something you can substitute it yeah. for. Like, you don't have to use bread flour. You can just use basic white flour to make bread. Yeah. You don't have to use a particular type of green in your recipe. You can substitute broccoli for kale, for frozen spinach, for peas, for anything really you're just adding a pop of something bright and fresh and and healthy to it mm. um you know most herbs and spices are interchangeable you can you can interchange lemon juice and vinegar quite quite easily in most recipes and 
and most things are substitutable for something else. I'm, I'm not a purist. My recipes aren't prescriptive. What I love is when people gain enough confidence in their own ability to say, well, I made you a recipe, but I didn't have this, so I used that. And I didn't have this, so I used that. And it, it turned out great. And I'm like, brilliant, go fly little yeah, one off yeah, into the world. Yeah. You, you, you now know how to cook. Yeah. I mean, you don't need me anymore. And ideally, I'd be writing myself out of a job. I'd be giving everybody those skills and those those qualities and those attributes and that confidence in the kitchen to mm. be able to put down their cookbooks and go, well, now I know what to do yeah. with what I've got. And yeah. that's, that's what I want to, you know, that's what I want to achieve yeah. is that people don't need me anymore. Tell me about the black tea tip, because I think that's, gee, I've never <laughs> read that. I've never read that before. It's amazing. It's genius. So I've, I've got a bit of an odd brain and it doesn't work like <laughs> other people's and that doesn't make me special, it makes me a menace basically, especially in the world of food. And sometimes I'll hit a roadblock and I'll go, a lot of my recipes for a while used red wine. Yeah. Because I'd buy a bottle of two pound, like Tempranillo, cheap from Tesco or whatever, and I would just use it in all my cooking. Mm. And then somebody said to me, well that's quite a privileged thing to be able to buy a bottle of wine yeah. just to use to cook. Yeah. <laughs> too quick for a great big bottle of wine you're only using a slot of it here and there yeah. but, uh, but the idea of it is something that most people wouldn't do yeah so yeah like, mm, okay right get me checking my privilege <laughs> so I thought well if if you didn't have wine or didn't want to use wine or for whatever reason didn't want to have it in the house or cook with it what what could you do so at that point, I then break things down by what their function is in a recipe. Mm. It's like, okay, so wine, what you want really is a slightly meaty, strong, tanniny flavour. Mm. What else gives you that flavour? Tea. Yeah. I was like, no, <laughs> maybe. No, <laughs> I'll try it. Yeah. So I did, I put some strong black tea in, a, I think it was a bourguignon recipe. I was like, right, I'll strip the wine out, I'll put tea in instead. Yeah. And it worked. It's not, you're not tearing up tea bags. No, you're no, you're just, just stewing a tea bag a, and oh right, pouring, okay. the, pouring the same amount of strong black tea in as you would add red wine. It only works for recipes, really, that have quite a long, slow cook to them. Otherwise, yeah. they taste like tea. Um, and tea's great, that's not a bad yeah. thing, but it's not really what you want for your tea. Um, so, yeah, that was, that was a, that's one of those things that people then tried because they didn't quite believe it. Mm. And then they're like, oh, actually, that, that works. Oh, I'm going to try that. that. <laughs> I did. That, that was me. <laughs> and someone a couple of weeks ago on Twitter, um, I put a recipe up and they said, oh, did you know you can use black tea instead of red wine? <laughs> I was like, I do know, I? actually, because I came up with that. And they were like, oh, yes, I did. <laughs> I was like, I wasn't offended. I was, I was pleased that it had gone that yeah. far out into the world, that people were feeding it back to Amazing. me. Like, oh, I've got this great tip for you. I'm like, Amazing. You know, go on, <laughs> give it to me. It's brilliant. So you're a vegan now, um, but does this mean that your recipes in this book are all vegan? No. Um, well, I'm, um, I, I'm mostly vegan. I, I try really hard to, you know, live a vegan lifestyle, cook vegan recipes, test vegan recipes, but there are limits within my job and my work to what I can do. So i quite reluctant to describe myself now as a vegan okay. because there's groups of vegan purists who are like but you're still wearing your leather trousers so yeah. but you're not vegan enough and I think I think I've just I've stepped slightly back from the label because there's no there's no way to turn around to a group of people and say I'm vegan without them hearing I'm a dickhead <laughs> and that's awful <laughs> to say yeah but there I mean I've had I still cook um non-vegan meals for my child um and i volunteer at food banks and shelters and and I'm not going to go in there and cook a load of chickpea curry for people and what they actually want is, is a hot pot yeah. and so there are limits to what I can do in my professional life but at home it's plant-based vegetable based food products um, but my recipes because I'm still cooking for my son and I'm still cooking in other areas they're not all vegan but about 90% of them are and I, I go by the theory that if if everybody cooked a little bit less meat, a little bit less fish, some fewer eggs, it would have a greater impact on animal welfare and the environment and yeah. the planet than, say, a handful of people going hardcore, militant, vegan. Mm. Um, so I kind of square it that way. And that's never going to be good enough for some people, but I'm, I'm sort of beyond trying to... Yeah. Like, 10% of my readership are vegan, and there's plenty there for them. 
but the rest of my readership are single mums on the dole, people using food banks, people teaching themselves to cook, and I don't want to alienate themselves, them, them from the idea of exploring plant-based mm -hmm. and vegan recipes by going waving a big klaxon at them, because I don't think you, yeah. I don't think that gets very far, I don't think that achieves anything. And I just got to a point where I was kind of tired of being told, no matter what I did, that I wasn't vegan enough. So I was like, oh, balls to it then. I'll just, <laughs> I'll, just I'll carry you. on doing what I do and <laughs> I'll do it well. And if it's not good enough for you, then you can moan at me on the internet about it. But do you know what? I'm, I'm doing what I do because I've got people that I want to help and yeah. educate and I don't have time to waste on arguments about like how many brownie points I've got or how many vegan brownie points I've got. Yeah. I'm just going to do my job. Yeah. And, but yeah, most of my new recipes are vegan um, by default or they've got, because that's what I'm cooking day in, day out, so of course they're going to be. But there's the odd one sneaks in that isn't. It'll be mm. something that I've cooked for my son or whatever. And I'm just like, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, you know, if you don't like it, you don't have to read it. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah. It's you can unsubscribe. You <laughs> yeah. can, you know, no one's making you go out yeah. and buy the eggs, people. It's, it's fine. Yeah. So, yeah, I've, I've sort of reached a sort of happy middle ground with it, whereby most of the stuff I put in my own mouth is vegan, but not everything that comes out of my hands yeah. is. So. so you mentioned social media and Twitter, mm -hmm. and you came mm -hmm. off it. Early this year. Oh, I'm always storming. <laughs> always. So tell, tell me about that. I just which which <laughs> specific period are we talking about? I mean, um, I get to a point with social media sometimes where you just go, oh, do you know? I just need some peace and yeah. quiet. I just need to be able to chill out, have some space in my head that's not full of people telling you all the time that you're wrong and that you're terrible and that you're awful mm. and you're a minger and whatever. Mm. So every now and then I just take a quiet break from it. And I always think, this is going to be the end. This is me. I'm leaving Twitter. <laughs> um, I, I can't be bothered with it. And then I'm like, mm, a bit bored. Yeah. I want to cause some mischief. <laughs> I'll go back. Um, and yeah, so, but I've recognised now I'm probably never going to leave it for good, but I do walk away from it every now and then and just go, do you know, I just need some space in it. That's, it's like going to work and walking through your office. And as you walk through your office, everybody you walk past goes, you're shit at your job. You're awful. You're yeah, ugly. You're fat. You're yeah. terrible. You're not a real vegan. You're atrocious. <laughs> we hate you. It'll be really hard to work in that yeah. environment. And a lot of what I do is based around social media. People say, why don't you come off it? And you're like, because no, I wouldn't have can't. a career yes. anymore. It's, it's not, I'm not well known enough to have the luxury of not, it, not doing like self-promotion PR, reminding people I'm here. And um, you're, a compa you're a campaigner as well. And so I mean, you, you, you are to, there to have yeah. bits there for your voice, isn't it? So yeah, I do, I take breaks from it, but I'm self-aware enough now to realise I'm probably never going to leave yeah. it for good yeah. because there's a lot that's good about it yeah. as well about social media there's a lot of community there's a lot of connection but those voices tend to get drowned out by negativity mm. um, more often than not mm. and there's a recipe in your book called self-love stew mm. tell me about that because there's a story around that there is that's that recipe came from um you know it's no secret that i i suffer from depression yeah. and um, and always have done. And in those periods, it's quite difficult to remember to love yourself enough to cook for yourself. And mm. I go through phases where I just live off bags of crisps, endless bags of crisps, one after the other, because I don't want to cook for myself. I can't be bothered. Mm. It's too much effort. And I got to a point where I thought, I need to find a happy middle ground whereby I can just do something quick, simple, nourishing, that's not too taxing and will you know, get me out of this cycle of self-pity, basically. Mm. Um, so I started to do very simple recipes along those lines, and the self-love stew was one of them. And it's just literally just chuck a couple of things into a pot, whatever you've got to hand, a tin of tomatoes, some frozen veg, um, tofu or chicken or butter beans, or whatever you've got in the cupboard, and just let it cook. But it's just the act of... It's just a very simple no chopping, no anything, just tip it all in a pan, let it do its thing. Uh, but at the end of it, you've got something that is good, it's good for you, that you've made, that you've achieved. And for me, as soon as I get back in the kitchen, in any cycle of sort of depression or anxiety, that's the moment from which things start to get better. Mm. And it's the times where I don't feel like cooking for myself and the times that I most should. 
Mm. And so I, I've created that as a sort of a, a stepping stone between the crisps and the healing. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's just there in the middle. And, and it, it's a recipe that's resonated with a lot of people yeah. that people post pictures of on Instagram all the time or send me photos of or write to me about and they say actually this was their stepping stone towards getting better. And that's again bringing around so social media that part, that community of just you, all of you, everybody's in it together, and bringing that as well. Yeah, I just love the uh, the tone of it. It's mm. really good. Yeah, it was originally written as an Instagram post, and when I went to write it up into a proper recipe, I just found I couldn't change it. I couldn't do anything with it. It changed too much of what the recipe was about. Yeah. So I just kept it as oh, it was. really as it was yeah and it just had to stay as it was that was that's the bit overleaf that you so spoon it into a bowl sit in your favorite spot hug that bowl to yourself enjoy every mouthful shoulders down you did this you made this for yourself out of love you're nourishing yourself you are smart you're kind to yourself you're important and you can wash up tomorrow. And that is, I think, I've never seen a recipe that ends yeah. like that. But it is the whole, you did this, this was an achievement, you should be grateful to yourself for doing this, you love yourself enough to put something good into your yeah. body, you need to acknowledge that and just run with it. Because sometimes I think we do overlook the acts of self-care and acts of self-love that we do for ourselves every single day. Yeah. And sometimes we do underestimate the importance of taking a moment to just take care of yourself. Yeah. In a world where we're all rushed off our feet, where we're all being d demands made of us left, right and centre, uh, in a world that's simultaneously always telling us we're not quite good enough, our kitchens aren't big enough, our recipes aren't posh enough, our, our wastes aren't thin enough, we're not great enough parents, we need to do more, we need to be better, we need to be smaller, we need to take up less space but simultaneously be greater. Actually, it's nice to just have someone go, you're doing all right, yeah. actually. You made yourself a stew, you're doing all right. Yeah. And that just felt, when I submitted this recipe to my editor, I was like, this stays in, <laughs> this end bit. It's yeah. not orthodox, but nothing I do <laughs> is. This stays in. Good and on it you. did. And I'm lucky to have an editor that, that completely gets yeah. that. Yeah. That, would just, that just goes, OK, great, yeah, yeah. That's, that's you. That's, yeah. that's what makes you you, and we'll, we'll leave it there. This book is very, very you. Yeah, it is. I was flicking through it on the way. This is very I you. only got this copy today. I was flicking through it in the cab on the way here, and I was like, simultaneously really <laughs> proud of myself and slightly mortified at some of the things that I've said. I'm like, oh, no, no. Just, I just, you I just, be. it's you just, shouldn't be. It is very me. Oh, congratulations. Um, and you're going to. Show me how to cook something. Yes, is, well, I mean, cooking is, is, a, is well, a strong it, word when it comes to well, my it's recipes. Cooking <laughs> in my, it's cooking in my bag. So it's <laughs> microwave mac and cheese. Yep, I can show you how to do that. In a mug. In a mug, in a amazing. microwave. It's amazing. Excellent. Just, so, all it's right. a very easy go-to Show me how. Recipe, Lead me the I way. Will. So um, first grab a mug and um, put 75 grams of macaroni into it or any other short pasta. 75 grams of macaroni is like two generous handfuls. So you say half a mug of pasta, really, um, because it's going to swell and grow as it absorbs the liquid. So you put any more than that in there, it's going to piss up sides and not be particularly nice. Um, cover it with 250 mils of cold water. That's it covered, and then a splash more. And crumble in half a stock cube. You can use beef stock cubes, give it a really nice, I think they call it a marmy flavour, yeah. which basically means salty. Um, but if you're vegetarian, then a vegetable stock cube will do just fine. Cover the mug with cling film. This is really important. It needs two layers of cling film and all the way down the sides of the mug. And then pierce it several times with a fork or a sharp knife or a skewer, whatever you've got to hand. Sharp fingernail if you're one of those people. Stick it in a bowl to catch any excess liquid that comes out. And then with a saucer on top to weigh the cling film down. Pop it in the microwave, cook it on full power for two minutes and then take it all out. It's normal for the water to bubble up and over the sides. That's what your bowl's for. So take the saucer off, peel the cling film off, take the mug out of the bowl, get the sloshy water that's in the bowl, tip it back into the mug, and then reassemble it. It's like doing Lego, but for like adults. Put the mug back in the bowl, stick the saucer back on top, stick it back in the microwave, and do it for another two minutes. Give it all a good stir, 
You might need to repeat this step again, it depends. So you might need to do it twice, you might need to do it three times, which is like, you know, not all mugs are equal, not all microwaves are equal either. So once it's nice and soft and swollen, take it out of the microwave, take a sauce off the top, take it out of the bowl, add your butter, stir in the marmite, grate over the cheese, give it all a stir, it's ready to go. Okay, I can't wait to try this, it smells gorge. Oh, bigger. Just get, just, just go get it. stuck just get in. in. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did a good job. Well done. Comfort food in a mug. It's pretty good. Um, food, I think. What do you think? What makes the world go around? Food. Food in mugs, generally. Yeah. Anything else? Um, love, kindness, being nice to people, justice, and. Comfort food, nice things, good things like this. Go on, have it. Go on, have thank it. you. <laughs> Seize well, it. Take thank it. You. Run with it. <laughs> thank you for sort of teaching me today how to do this, and just good luck with everything. Thank you very much.